Welcome to Worship with Faith Community Christian Reformed Church of Wyoming, Michigan. It's good again to gather together as the family of God, as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, to worship together and to hear God's word for us this morning. I want to mention at this time of year, of course, we say the acclamation, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. And we also ask a question, where does our help come from, beloved? Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And as he is the one who greets us. And he says to each and every one of us, grace and mercy and peace be unto you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Let all God's people say, Amen. I want to mention before we enter into a time of prayer that to remember to on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., we've committed and, and uh, covenanted together to just spend a few moments in prayer. So whatever you're doing at that time, just uh, get before God and pray about this whole situation with COVID-19 and pray for our world and for our church and for others as well. Let's go to our God in prayer at this time. Almighty God, we confess how hard it is to be your people. You have called us to be the church, to continue the mission of Jesus Christ to our lonely and confused world. Yet we acknowledge we are often more apathetic than active, more isolated than involved, more calloused than compassionate, more obstinate than obedient, and more legalistic than loving. Gracious Lord, have mercy upon us and forgive our sins. Remove the obstacles, including the coronavirus, that prevent us from being your representatives to a broken world. Awaken our hearts to the promised gift of your indwelling spirit. This we pray in Jesus' powerful name. And thankfully, Lord God, you've told us in your word that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners that to all who confess their sins and resolve to lead a new life, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And Lord Jesus, you also say, follow me. We want to follow you, Christ Jesus. So help us confess and profess and tell out your name. Help us to offer ourselves as living sacrifices and help us fight against sin and the devil every single day. Father in heaven, we know you are almighty and you are all powerful. So once again, we also come to you to plead in prayer for an end to the COVID-19 crisis. Lord God, will you please intervene and display your glory for all to see, leaving no question that you are Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Father, walk with all of us through this time. We are all inconvenienced. We are all struggling. We are all powerless in so many ways. And Father, we recognize our total dependence on you in the midst of our fears and our anxieties. Walk with us, we pray. Every moment of every day, walk with us, we pray. Bless all those who are sick who are grieving, who are fighting for life, and bless our medical community who are helping people fight for their lives, and bless those who've lost their jobs. Bless our servicemen in these days too. Father, sustain us and fill us with your Holy Spirit's good gifts to overflowing so that we may overflow your grace and loving kindness and compassion to all those with whom we have contact. Lord God, in this strange time we're living in, draw us closer to you. Help us to dig into your word often. Help us to get before you in prayer, on our knees, pleading with you, Father, to help us. And so that is our prayer this morning. Father in heaven, help us. Help us. Help us. We pray in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, we're continuing our series of messages related to the Heidelberg Catechism. And so I'm going to read first a passage of Scripture, 1 Peter 
chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. 1 Peter 2, verses 9 through 12. We read these words. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we'd also like to look at the questions and answers from Lord's Day 12 of the Heidelberg Catechism, question 31 and 32. Why is he called Christ, meaning anointed? Because he, that is Jesus, has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance. Our only high priest, who has set us free by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually pleads our cause with the Father and our eternal King, who governs us by his word and spirit, and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. And then question 32, But why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ, and so I share in his anointing. I am anointed to confess his name, to present myself to him as a living sacrifice of thanks, to strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for all eternity. Beloved in Christ, today is Mother's Day. So I'd like to join my voice also to the great Mother's Day crowd who are all saying that today to the many moms and grandmas and female caregivers in their lives, Happy Mother's Day to you all. Funny thing about the name mom or mama or mother or mommy, it really isn't your name, is it? I know this for sure because with each of my kids, there came a point in their lives when they realized that the woman who was rearing them moment by moment every single day also had a real name. You'd point at people in the room and you'd ask your toddler, who is that? And they'd answer, mommy. But then when they got a little bit older, you asked them, but do you know her real name? And at some point, they would eventually get it, that their precious mommy had another name too. It was Allison. Now we're doing this with our grandkids, too. It's, it's a lot of fun. So the name Mom, when you think about it, is not really your mother's name at all. More precisely, it's a title, right? A title for those who have the most wonderful job in the universe, but also the most difficult job in the universe. I'm trying to score points with my mom and my wife here, okay? But... There is a point, and I'm about to make it. When we say the name of our Savior, Jesus, we often use the word Christ interchangeably as Jesus' alternate name. Or we think of the word Christ as Jesus' last name. First name Jesus, last name Christ. But obviously this isn't correct. No, it's a lot more like my wife or my mother or my daughter or anyone else's for that matter, having a name, but then also having that title mom or mommy or mother for the wonderful and difficult job they are called to do. Same with our Savior, having the name Jesus that goes along with his title 
Christ. So Jesus is the Christ. And along with that title comes the jobs that Jesus, the Christ, came to do. Christ is his job title, so to speak. Think of that first question we read from the Catechism. Why is Jesus called Christ, meaning anointed? So right in that question, we find out the title Christ means anointed. And when we hear that word anointed, we know that it involves a kind of consecration or a setting of that person apart for a specific purpose. That's what we have to keep in mind here. Jesus was anointed for something, to do something, to do a job. There was a purpose in his anointment. A purpose ordained by God the Father and a purpose empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit at his baptism. When the Holy Spirit came down as a dove and descended on Jesus and the voice out of heaven spoke, You are my Son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Jesus was right then and there, anointed for his job, his service, on this earth, and he was anointed to do the job of someone who was in the offices of prophet, priest, and king. So the question becomes, what does Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, do in these three offices? These were three offices all the way back in Bible times, the office of prophet, the office of priest, the office of king, and Jesus takes on all of these jobs, these offices. Well, let's take them in that order. First, he takes the office of prophet. What's the job there? Well, the Catechism says a prophet is someone who speaks for God to the people. That's what Jesus the Christ did. He was anointed to be the chief prophet. According to the Catechism, our chief prophet in that office reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance. In the Gospel of John, for example, Jesus tells his disciples, everything that I learned from my Father, I've made known to you. Jesus speaks for God to his people. In fact, in our scripture passage, we see the words in verse 9, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now, this is talking about how believers should declare praises to God. But this is exactly the thing Jesus did as well. Or more correctly, the thing Jesus does first before the believer. Jesus declared the praises of his Father in heaven. In the original language, the word praises here has a much deeper meaning. It means declare the glories. In other words, the glorious deeds, the mighty acts of God. And Jesus declared those glorious deeds. So in Jesus' life and in Scripture, we see him exercising the office of prophet. We see Jesus revealing the will of God the Father to us, that we should be saved through the Son. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As prophet, Jesus reveals our deliverance. He tells us of our deliverance. He speaks through his word and spirit. He speaks to the Father, for the Father, that is, to his people, and he reveals our deliverance. And as a matter of fact, he revealed, of course, that he himself is our deliverance. He prophesied that good news. That is Jesus' work in the office of prophet. Well, how about the office of priest? The second one. The Christ is anointed as priest. A priest's office or their work is used to bring people to God through sacrifice and prayer. And that's what Jesus the Christ did. He was anointed, according to the Catechism, to be our only high priest. And as that only high priest, Jesus set us free by the one sacrifice of his body. In the book of Hebrews, the author writes about Jesus that he said, Here I am, I have come to do your will, Father. By that will, Hebrews 10 says, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus once for all. In verse 12, the writer continues, But when this priest, that is, our only high priest Jesus, when this priest 
had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. His work on the cross as our sacrifice was finished, paying for our sin was finished. He sat down. The work was done. Jesus brought his people to the Father through his sacrifice on the cross in the office of priest. Jesus also brings us to the Father through his work of intercession, through prayer. He continually pleads our cause with the Father. Romans 8 tells us that Christ Jesus is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. He is there for us as our mediator. He is our legal representative. He is pleading our cause with the Father. That's incredible. To think that Jesus Christ is in heaven right now, interceding for us. Do you know what the result of that is? We are defended and kept safe from our enemies. The good shepherd whom we read about in the Gospel of John has us, his sheep, in his hands. And no one will snatch those sheep, will snatch us away from him. Not only that, because of Jesus' intercession, he watches over us in such a way that not a hair can fall from our heads without the will of the Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for our salvation. And if those words sound familiar, they're words from the question and answer one of the Heidelberg Catechism. They are part of our only comfort, our only strength in life and in death. By pleading our cause in heaven, Jesus assures us of that comfort and strength for our living. As a priest, then, Jesus brings us to the Father through his once-for-all sacrifice and through his intercession at his Father's right hand. You remember, as a prophet, Jesus reveals what our deliverance is. It's him. Now, as priest, we find out for sure, yes, indeed, Jesus is our deliverance through his sacrifice on the cross, through his intercession at his Father's right hand. Praise God! That is Jesus' work in the office of priest. And now what about the office of king, the third one? Jesus is Christ, the anointed king, as well as priest and prophet. A king rules over his people on behalf of God. Jesus is the king, the king of all creation. We know this from the closing words of Matthew, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. In Philippians as well, we read, Therefore God exalted him, to, uh, that is Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father, Jesus is king. He carries all authority, exalted to the highest place. He is king. And according to the catechism, Jesus is our eternal king. He governs us by his word and spirit, and he guards us and keeps us in the freedom that he has won for us. Jesus himself assures us of his steadfastness as our king. Again, at the end of Matthew, we read, Surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. He will guard and keep us as his brothers and sisters. King Jesus will do it. He has the authority as king. Jesus, in the role of king, of course, was a humble servant, gently riding into Jerusalem on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Remember Palm Sunday? But now that humble servant, a humble servant king, is exalted high above all creation. King Jesus rules his creation on behalf of his Father and will do it forevermore. That's Jesus' work in the office of king. Jesus is our chief prophet, our only high priest, and our eternal king. Praise his name. But then the catechism asks a very pointed question. It's the so what question. So what does that have to do with you, Christian? Why is the title Christ part of the title that you call yourself? Christian, Christian, 
What is that supposed to mean? Why are you called a Christian? And the answer, because by faith, I'm a member of Christ. I'm united to him. I'm in Christ. I belong to him. My life is his for the using, and that only because of faith. And then the question and answer tells us something incredible. We share in the anointing of Christ. Listen again. We share in the anointing of Christ. We, the church, are anointed. We are set apart. We are devoted to, consecrated for the office of believer. The threefold office of believer or Christian that is anointed as prophet, priest, and king. For those who believe by faith, they are anointed to be used as prophets, priests, and kings. The difficult work that Jesus did on the cross and does now becomes the wonderful work we get to do. First, we're anointed as prophets to confess his name, not to reveal ourselves as the Savior, no, of course not, but to confess his name as Savior and Lord. Second, we are anointed as priests to present ourselves to him as living sacrifices of thanks, not to present ourselves as a sacrifice of atonement. No, of course not. That was done once and for all by Jesus himself already on the cross. That was the difficult work. Rather, we have the wonderful work of presenting ourselves as living sacrifices to him in thanksgiving for what he has done for us. And third, we are anointed as kings and queens to strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life. Not to do the difficult work of destroying sin and the devil. No, of course not. Only the one who has been given all authority can destroy sin and destroy the devil. Instead, we have the wonderful task of striving against sin and against Satan. You see, we share in the anointing of Jesus Christ, and we are anointed to the threefold offices of prophet, priest, and king. You remember the words of our scripture passage? Peter says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him, the glorious works of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Do you hear them all? All the offices are right there. Prophet, priest, and king. You are a royal, that is a kingly priesthood. There's two of them right there, king and priest. And what do these Christians do? They declare the praises, the mighty acts of him who called you. There's the office of prophet, declaring his praises, confessing his name. But we hear more as the passage goes on. Peter says, I urge you to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. There's the office of king again, striving against sin and the devil. And then Peter says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. There's the other two again. Live such good lives among the pagans, the office of priest being a living sacrifice of thanks in our living. And what may happen? They may see your good deeds and glorify God. Well, there's the office of prophet confessing his name in both word and deed. The threefold office, prophet, priest, and king. Peter repeats it right in that passage of four verses or so. He says it once, and then he says it again. Your prophets, your priests, your kings, your prophets, your priests, your kings. Beloved, because Jesus the Christ did the difficult work, we, the Christians, get to do the wonderful work. Jesus the Christ was anointed to do the most difficult job in the world, die on the cross, so that we Christians could be anointed to do the most wonderful jobs in the world. We share in the anointing of Christ. We're prophets, priests, and kings. What a wonderful job we have. Long time ago, when I was about nine years old, our school, Timothy Christian's varsity basketball team, got second place in the state of Illinois. 
Small school, this is a big deal. A few days later, the city of Elmhurst allowed our Christian school community to have a parade down their main street. That's a big deal. Bunch of uh, decorated cars and pickup trucks holding a bunch of excited kids and their adults cheering for their team. The two-lane, one-way street through Main Street, through the city, was was not closed off for the parade, however. We simply all had to ride in one lane so other traffic could go around us as needed. And I remember my good friend and I sitting in the back of my dad's truck, cheering and joking all around, and a car pulled next to us, not part of the parade, was stopped with us at the red light, and the young man in the car on the passenger side had his window open. And he asked my friend and me, looked up in the pickup truck, asked my friend and me what the, what the parade was for. And we excitedly told him that we won second place in the state tournament. And he asked us, what school? And we proudly told him, Timothy Christian. Oh, he replied, that's a bunch of Jesus freaks. And he mockingly laughed with his other friends in the car. And my 10-year-old good friend next to me, without batting an eye, without any anger, said right back to him, well, that's better than Satan's. And the guy in the car told his friend, let's get out of here, and they sped on ahead. I'll never forget that. Either comment. That's a bunch of Jesus freaks. That's better than Satan's. I imagine the man in that car probably forgot about it, but maybe not. For here was a 10-year-old boy confessing the name of Jesus. Here was a kid presenting himself as a living sacrifice of thanks. Here was a little child striving against sin and the devil. And maybe that guy never forgot that. I hope he didn't. I hope it somehow made a difference in his life. My friend, I'll never forget. I'll never forget it for sure. He was doing the wonderful work of exercising his anointed threefold office of prophet, priest, and king. It was a privilege and a responsibility for him, and he took it. This little 10-year-old was anointed by the Holy Spirit to that office. And beloved, you know what? So are we. Anointed to the most wonderful jobs of prophets, priests, and kings, because Jesus, in his most difficult job, saw to it. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for anointing us in Jesus Christ. Empower us by your Holy Spirit to tell out the name of Jesus, to offer ourselves as living sacrifices of thanks, and to strive against sin and the devil. Thank you, Jesus the Christ, for doing the most difficult job in the world so that we could have the most wonderful. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, beloved in Christ, receive the blessing of our God. Go, go before you to lead you. God, go beneath you to protect you. God, go behind you to support you. God, go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. May the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon you. Do not be afraid. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.